Welcome to Insight, today produced in collaboration with KCOS 13 El Paso Public Television. Today we are chatting with Linda Velarde, Executive Director of El Paso Via Maria. Linda has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Linda, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So, Via Maria is, is such an interesting organization and very unusual. You are the only uh, shelter for single women. In the, in the entire region. Yeah, here in El Paso we are. Um, there's, been, there's been a couple of other shelters that have closed, had to close our doors due to funding cuts. Um, and so now we are the only, we, we fill a, a certain niche in El Paso, and that's single women uh, whose children aren't with them. So how do women come to you? What, what shape are they in? What have they just recently experienced that caused them to come to your shelter? Well, they come... Um, they come from different places. They, they're, off, they're often referred to us by judges, by some drug diversion programs. They'll come to us that way. Um, they'll be coming straight out of prison or um, through rehabilitation facilities. Um, when, when women who have some types of substance abuse problems, we want them some. We want them steeped into a path before they get to us. Um, but they do often come in crisis, and uh, what we try to do is stabilize them and get them you know, get them through the facility and transition them into self-sufficiency. Talk about your different programs. In addition to just providing a safe place, talk about how you help these women make that transition so, from the moment they walk into your diverse. Okay, so what, we have a really beautiful shelter here in Segundo Barrio, and we've been, the building has been there for a long time, and we are capable of holding having 22 women at a time. And each woman has their own room and their own bathroom. Um, it's a very loving and warm environment. It feels like a home, not a shelter. Um, and I also have a caseworker who works intensely with each woman. And so she knows everything about each woman that comes through that door. And they figure out, they, the two of them figure out what their problems are, what their issues are, what brought them to Via Maria. Why are they homeless and why are, are they having the problems that they're having? Um, and then they figure out a plan and then and, and how to get them to a point where they can be self-sufficient. And that could be, you know, for each, each woman it's different. You know, it's obviously depending on what her issue is. Um, and so for instance, if you have someone who comes in with drug, substance abuse problems, um, it's important for her to be on to either be going to AA or NA meetings. We have those at the shelter, um, but we make sure that they are going to their meetings. There, you know, some of them who come from those issues are on probation or parole. They've come out of prison because of it. And they need to report back on They've a regular basis, mm -hmm. and, and there are certain <clears throat> behavioral restrictions that are that are yeah, part of that yeah, parole. Yeah, we're, you know, we're a transitional living center. We're, it's kind of like a halfway house. We have rules. You know, we have curfews. They, you know, several of them have to abide by that, depending again on their situation. Um, and they got to be back at six, you know, in the afternoon or in the evening for dinner. And I mean, we, uh, it's, you know, it, it, there's there's freedom there, but there's not. It's a program. You know, we we've got a program for them, and they it, if they if they want if they're ready to move on in their lives and turn you know the leaf over, we're there for them. And this is an important concept. It's a voluntary re-education mm -hmm. center. So when you come in and you agree to receive these services, you also are creating an agreement with Via Maria. Correct. Right. That you will do your best to, to shift some of those behaviors that have not been productive in right. your own life. Right. Yeah, and they've got to be willing to do it. And you know, most of the women that go through it are pretty successful. They they leave Via Maria with some type of income and affordable housing to go to, and you know, something to do. They don't. We don't have women there sitting idle. You know, we make sure that they, if they need to go to, you know, see the psychiatrist, that they have access to that. If they need a GED class, you know, so that they can pass the GED, we make sure that that happens. Um, if they need dental work, we find dentists for them. And we do whatever it is that they need to get them through and get them through Via Maria and back on their feet. 
So you serve 22 women at any one time. How many women do you serve annually? So this last this last funding year, we did 57 women. Mm -hmm. um, we've been around 10 years now, so we've we've had over 500 women come through our facility. It's, it's to me that's a staggering number, and you know I would say that our success rate is probably about 75 to 80 percent. And for those women who, mm -hmm. for whom you have not been successful, what happens with them? Are they, do they, do they come back through your program? Or some do. How do you, how do you follow them? Well, we do some checks on them, um, but it's difficult to, you know, to, to keep after the women who have graduated. You know, we, we're, we've got to work on the women that are there. Right. And we have had some, that have come back through our facility. Some of those women who we're not successful with have maybe mental health care concerns that, that in many cases, that, that's a very difficult um, issue to, to treat and to work with. Um, and oftentimes, th those are the women that you'll see in emergency shelters where however hard you try, um, you can only get there to a certain point. And and so that so those are probably a, a big amount, a large amount of the women who are not successful. The other ones are the victims of domestic violence because there's a very big cycle, a very hard cycle to break. And especially when you have a woman who's not educated, who's never worked, um, has lots of children, her the security is in her home, and for them to have the courage to leave that. And to think that they could do it on their own, it's just a huge obstacle. It's really hard. So that's probably another percentage of women that were, is hard to rehabilitate. And you're caught in a vice very often between your dependence and the <clears throat> violence that you have to tolerate in order, in order to, to have some level of security. So it's not a black or white situation. You mm -hmm. have your children to think about. Um, and 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 how that is going to function, what is best for the child, mm -hmm. what will you tolerate? It is the kind of calculus that is so very difficult. There's no trite answer to it. No, there isn't, and it's in a case by case basis. Each woman is, you know, has got a different, you know, a different life, um, and you know, different struggles. You know, there's a in, uh, to me, there's a real important statistic amongst homeless women. Um, I worked for legal aid f before I took this job here, and I worked with the homeless community as well. And um, most of my female clients, I was I was get, giving uh, getting them disability. I was doing administrative work with them, and so I was I had access to medical records and mental health rec records. And so for most of the women that I had probably 95% of those women had been molested at some point in their life. 95% had been molested. At some point in their life. And um, I think that's the major source of home for homeless women. I, that's why they're homeless. They, they have that in their background. And trying to get back into some type of normal um, world, they've never had it. So, you know, how do, how, how do you live a normal life when... You know, they've been abused and molested, and they seek drugs to, you know... To self-medicate. To, to self-medicate, or, you know, they become criminals and, you know, thieves and whatever it is to, to, to deal with that history and past. And the tragedy is that sexual violence, ironically, becomes an indoctrination into a particular cycle. Yes. It's, that is very difficult to break. You, the, you have... Uh, issues of self-image. Mm -hmm. You have issues of of how your brain chemistry reacts and and how you become addicted to certain cycles. And then in your own life, you just repeat and repeat and repeat what you don't, what you hate about yourself. Yeah. And that that in and of itself becomes corrosive to to moving on. Right. And 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 so your programs are really created to start to address so many of these issues. Yeah, and I believe what Via Maria does differently in some places is that we honor the dignity of each person, no matter where they came from. Um, you know, and we forgive people for 
or mistakes or whatever it is that brought them there because, you know, we're not all, none of us are told how to live life. And right. especially when you're, you're starting at a negative, you know, when you've been abused or, you know, so, so we honor each, each woman that comes in and we try to, you know, empower them, um, and teach them that, that they're worth it just to start, you know, that, you know, it's okay that they're there now and they're safe and, and we love them and we're ready to, you know, I want them to have what I have in my life. I want every one of them to have that. And so what we do is try to teach them, you know, try to give them those things. So how does the funding work? Well, El Paso is a real giving community. I think there was some some study last year that said for as poor as we are here in El Paso, um, we're one of the most charitable communities in the country. So what percentage comes from both foundations and individual uh, donors versus government grants? It's probably a third each, no, a fourth, because we have a real big fundraiser. that We had a fundraiser in November, and I think the... The number I'm looking at is we've made about seventy thousand dollars for that from that fundraiser, mm -hmm. and it's huge. It, it's gotten bigger every year. We've had it for almost nine years now, um, and it's kind of the one of the events in El Paso, which is really nice because we're a really small, little tiny shelter with very quiet presence. Um, but we, we have this really fun party every year, and this year was you know, we we've just it's a good source of our income. Um, so I would say it's a fourth, um, except now we we lost our HUD funding. Um, HUD has been cutting funds to El Paso, to the El Paso, to everywhere in the country, I think. So housing and urban development is cutting funds in mm -hmm. support of, of these poverty programs. Right. They're, they've switched their they've switched the proportion from uh, funding services to funding rapid rehousing, which is a model that they've they're trying to push and it works i think if if the service the service web is in place um because the the idea is to house someone who's homeless immediately and then give them the services right so that that there's no homeless population but what's happening is is that the the um the funding is shifting away from services mm. to housing so what ends up happening is that you start to unbalance um, this this um, this support web, where you have housing but without services, and, right, and right. that can lead to a recidivistic kind of a cycle sure. in which people are housed temporarily, and then th then they go back into this cycle, which which throws them out of housing, which right then right. So you'll have a three month period of time where you may have the homeless population down because they're in housing, but you go back three months later and they're back out on the streets because they, they haven't give, been given the tools to, um, you know, to not be homeless, to learn how, you know, to have a job and to get the medications that they might need to be stabilized um, or to be going to, you know, AA classes or NA classes or, you know, if those services aren't around, they're going to end up back on the streets. And this is where change occurs. In yeah. Bernarde, thank you so much for sharing the work of El Paso's Via Maria, and thank you so much for your insights. Yeah, thank you for having me.